Why did I put Epi Episcopalians in parentheses up there? Because Episcopalians are what Anglicans are called in the United States. And when we get further on in the, the semester, we'll talk about why they, they use that name. It has to do with the Revolutionary War and the fact that a lot of Anglicans actually fought on the side uh, that lost. The, uh, they were Tories. And so they had to sort of prove their loyalty. Um, but we'll get to that discussion a bit later. Your book talks about the Anglican tradition, and again, we're talking about a, the, the conservative or traditional Reformation, uh, and it starts out very, very, very traditional. The only big change at the very start is who's in charge. And your book talks about a few precedents for this. The, the Spanish uh, monarchy held a very tight control over the church in, it, in its domains. Um, you know, the Spanish Inquisition was something that was not primarily run by the, the, you know, the Vatican or the, the Catholic Church as such. It was something run by the, the Spanish crown. And you know, they incorporated religious things. There was something called Gallicanism in France where the, the French king would say, I get to decide who the bishops are going to be and the French church should be more or less independent. Those kind of died out. In England, though, there was this guy... Um, who you've probably all seen pictures of. He's a big fat guy. Uh, he's usually in like you know a lot of, a lot of clothes. Uh, Henry, what number is he? There's a lot of Henrys. Eight. Henry the Eighth, right? And Henry the Eighth married a lot of people. Um, and back then it was actually pretty easy to it, it, not if you were an ordinary person, but if you were one of the nobility. It was pretty easy if you didn't like the person that you were married to and you had some power to get a divorce or an annulment. And oftentimes it had to do with like demonstrating that there was consanguinity. And there's a whole story there that's, that's quite interesting to talk about. Long story short, Henry wanted to divorce somebody and he appeals to the Pope, uh, Pope Clement VII. Uh, he, had, he had wanted to uh, get out of this marriage with Catherine of Aragon. Uh, and she, you know, she wasn't having male heirs. That's, that's part of the things that, that you want as a, as a king back then. Um, Henry was, you know, tied in pretty well with the church, but the Pope says no to him. And so Henry does something that for an English uh, monarch, because the English already had a long tradition of being sort of semi-independent, he says, I'm in charge. He gets Parliament to actually to, to agree to this, and he becomes the head of the English Church. And within the um, within the English Church, whoever ha or within the the uh, yeah within the, the Anglican Communion, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury is is the top religious official, but the Archbishop of Canterbury is chosen back then by the king, nowadays by, by who, who's in charge in England? It's not the king anymore, or the queen. Parliament, right? The prime minister. Um, so what you've got here is, is sort of like taking part of the church and saying, you guys do whatever you're going to do over there. We're going to do our thing here. And they didn't actually change anything in any important way under Henry, other than who's, who's in charge. Um, after Henry dies, like your book says, uh, well, there, there was one other th important thing that happens under Henry uh, that I should say. Your book do does talk about suppression of monasteries. Which means that they, they close the monasteries and they send the monks home. And the monasteries now belong to the king. And the king can do whatever he likes with them. Oftentimes, monasteries are pretty nice places because uh, monks tended to be pretty industrious and they'd also get a lot of donations. And so the king had a lot of wealth to spread around. Um, there are still, to this day, a, a very few uh, Anglican Benedictines, but all the rest of the orders have, have more or less disappeared. Um, there's some Anglican Benedictines up the road, by the way, uh, on, on the other side of the river. So, um, the liturgy didn't change, beliefs didn't change, doctrine didn't change. Um, it's only with later people 
like Edward. He's Edward the, uh, the Sixth. I'll put the Roman numerals. Under Edward the Sixth, you start seeing some changes. Um, and this guy, Thomas Cranmer, the archbishop at that time, starts introducing a lot of new practices because he's very impressed by the, the Protestant Reformation as it's going on in Germany, as it's going on in France, as it's going on in Switzerland. Um, so he, he tries to revise the church's order of worship, um, and, and the, addition of the, the first edition of the Book of Common Prayer comes out of that. And we'll talk about that and why it's important in a moment. Then you get uh, Mary. You guys might know her as Bloody Mary. Why, why is she called Bloody Mary? Because there's like blood a lot. Anyone know? Yeah. Yeah, how many people she put to death? Yeah, and, and some, you know, like any controversial thing, some, some people are going to say, yeah, like millions. And then others are going to be like, yeah, she didn't do anything. The truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, Mary tried to bring England back to Catholicism. And by that time, this, this new Anglican thing had become the going concern. Um, so a lot of people said, no, that, that, that's not going to be what we do. And then, you know, they find themselves martyred. Uh, and now, you know, to be fair, the, the Anglicans did plenty of martyring themselves of Catholics and of the independents. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of uh, blame to throw around throughout the Reformation. Uh, lots of people did lots of bad things to each other. But Mary does that, and that puts such a bad taste in people's mouth, this attempt to impose Catholicism by force, that when her sister, who we know is a very famous monarch, Elizabeth comes on, who reigned for a very long time. Um, she brings it back to, to Anglicanism, and her main concern is to, to make sure that um, there's peace in the kingdom, that England is safe from these Catholic powers like France and Spain at the time, and that uh, the church is actually going to, to be a going concern. It's not going to fall apart. Because another thing that's happening under Elizabeth's reign is the Puritans are coming to the fore. The Puritans are people who feel like this Anglican church has not purified itself enough of all these, what they call Romish elements, uh, you know, traditional Catholic elements. They wanted to get rid of you know, the traditional mass. They wanted to um, view the sacraments as, not, as, as being ordinances, see them in a very different way. They wanted a different church structure. They certainly didn't want the king in charge or the queen in charge of the church. They thought that that was a very bad idea. So Elizabeth is trying to like, you know, reconcile all these sides and keep the Catholics from coming back, back in and taking over. Um, and your book talks a little bit about the Puritans, but I'm going to skip over that because I, I want to talk about them in a later chapter where it's devoted to them. One of the upshots of this is that... Um, In these discussions with the Puritans, who were, were saying Bible alone, Scripture alone, um, the Church of England said that you have Scripture, you have tradition. It's starting to look a lot like, like the Catholics now, right? And the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, and then what was the third one for, for Roman Catholics? Magisterium. For that, for the Anglicans, reason. Three sources of three equally legitimate sources uh, figuring out how one ought to live the Christian life, how the church ought to be organized, who ought to be in charge, uh, you know, how far they should go in their, their reforms. Um, they talk about another important king who you uh, who you, you probably have, have at least heard of in terms of scripture. And that's King James. Why is, why is this guy significant? He's a Stuart king. Actually spends a lot of time get, you know, getting raised up in Scotland. Um, the King James Bible, the English translation. Yeah. Now, it, it wasn't at the time called the King James Bible. It was called the authorized version. But, but why was it 
you know, call the King James Bible. He's the one who authorized it. He got together all these scripture scholars, and, and he said, um, look, we've got to have a translation of the Bible, an Anglican translation of the Bible. Uh, why? Did, were they not having a, a translation in English? There were other English translations around. Why do you think they just didn't stick with the other English translations? Any guesses? Yeah. Uh, it didn't fit with what they were trying to say. Like what yeah, they very saying. good. You know what I expected to be the first response? Well, they just weren't very good translations and they, they needed to be improved. But you're exactly right. The Puritans were appealing to what was called the Geneva Bible. And the Geneva Bible, when you, when you translate scripture, you inevitably bring in some of your, your presuppositions, your, your ways of seeing things. And the Geneva Bible came from Geneva, where it was all Calvinists, and Calvinists and Anglicans didn't really mix doctrinally, so you didn't want people going around saying, well, look, the Bible says this on, on controversial points, so they came out with a, a Bible that, that in, in certain ways, fit the Anglican mold better. The King James Bible, by the way, I've got one right here, um, it's a great work of literature. It is, it is one of the most important works of literature in the English language. Um, you know, you can take, a, take a look at it. You might, you might say, oh, I don't want to read Shakespeare. This is very different than Shakespeare. It's using older English. Shakespeare, in order to like, you know, fully grasp what he's talking about, you need to know something like, they say, 50,000 words. Not this. This was written in a very simple style. Now, it has stuff like spake instead of spoke, but that's because that's the, the English of the time. And it's very beautiful uh, language, so I'll just you know, pass it around. Uh, by the way, there, there's a book, if you're interested in knowing the history of this, which is called God's Secretaries. It has a, a great history of the, the process of translation. Um, so King James Bible, um, another, I suppose we, if we're going to put the King James Bible, we should also say, the Book of Common Prayer as being something central. And if you look at the Book of Common Prayer, you find that it, it covers the, the liturgy, it covers um, all sorts of important things for, for Anglican communal life, the order of the Mass. Um, there's actually a couple different versions of it available now because there have been some controversies or splits over time in how it should be updated. Um, and the Anglicans are, in a certain respect, probably the closest to the older churches. They, they you know, trace their succession back to the apostles and they think that that matters. They view... Um, the, the Eucharist as being the real presence of, of Jesus, it, just like you know Catholics and Orthodox and, and Coptic Christians and all the way down the line do. And as opposed to, say, Lutherans who recognize two sacraments, baptism and um, communion, Anglicans are kind of conflicted. Are there two sacraments or are there seven sacraments? Like, like in the old, they, they actually, here's the, the way Anglicans very often resolve things, both. Just depends on how you look at it. Uh, they t the book talks about the middle way. Anglicans quite often are, are living within a kind of uh, intentional ambiguity about things. Um, now your book talks about the Anglican communion, and that's something that I, I should bring up as well. Anglicanism is, you know, you could say that it's an ethnic church, just like Lutheranism to a large extent is. Um, but the Lutherans didn't do an awful lot of colonizing, did they? You know, the, the, the Swedes and the Germans. Um, the British did, though, didn't they? Where did the British go to? Here. Right? Lose a colony, or sub-colonies. Where else? Where else were the British, like, a major concern? Africa. Yeah. And a lot of the Anglican churches that are still growing today are in Africa. Where else? Where else? Yeah. Uh, India? Yeah, the British controlled India for a long time. Interestingly, they didn't do, they didn't do 
the, the Anglicans didn't make a lot of progress in India. So there are some Indian Anglicans, but they're not, nothing like what happened in Africa, you know, with the, the mass conversions. Where else do you remember, besides, of course, Canada and, you know, um, Australia. Australia was more, you know, Irish. Uh, yeah. China. Well, little, little tiny pockets, but, because, um, you know, like the treaty cities. Um, thinking about somewhere, somewhere else. I'll give you a hint. Is Spanish the official language, besides, of course, Brazil with Portuguese, in all of North, or all of South and Central America? Or are there some, is there at least one place where English is the official language that you can think of? Some English colonization did take place, Belize, and other parts of South America. And like the African churches, these are, these are growing churches. The, the weight of the Anglican communion, uh, which by the way is kind of split in recent times, is swinging towards what we call the third world, you know, Africa, South America. Normally we would include um, Asia in that, but there's not a ton of Asian Anglicans. So that's enough for, for the time being about, about the Anglicans. Again, this is sort of like keep it in your pocket so you can, you can use this information later on as the story goes um, and gets more and more complicated. 